certainly not future. Future is one of the elements in concentric art. But if I had to name one, it probably would be that a work can start my inner thought tension. If you can do that, open up new space in my thinking, uh, then it's a work that catches my attention. And the, the collective work with me 
on, on these two films, they appreciate that part as well. So, yeah. Any other questions? So I have one question. So, uh, you planned, so now you have two documentaries, and to my understanding is that you planned to do a series of um, patrons in, yes. on uh, Asian, Asian contemporary art, right? And the way that you um, choose like which letters to work with, you said you have certain criteria, which I'm, I'm very curious to know, and also that why you start with realistic and not to... Okay, to, if you talk about collectors, there's a sea of collectors. If you, you can collect prints, you can collect stamps. So where do you begin? So when I first started the project, it was uh, there was a, a, a very stringent criteria, uh, which is the uh, collectors who have a social front. You know, if you have a collection and you keep it at home, that would not qualify you because it's for your private enjoyment. I'm interested in collectors with a social purpose with their collection. So with what they've collected, they share it with the society so that this can be for posterity. And that's why um, issues of authenticity, of provenance is very important because of passing down the story. It's, it's not just an oral tradition, it's a visual tradition you know, that you're passing down. Um, so uh, collectors who collect history, the historical development of the sea, Collectors who have a social front. Now, Police Six collection is not available to the public. Not, not like uh, uh, Dr. Lee, right? Uh, his is perhaps private museum, but Police Six donated his, uh, his works. So he will have a social front. So, and, and also, the collection must be rather, the collector must have had many, many years in the scene. Why is it important? The collectors must. Um, because we are looking at one particular scene through one person. Through Ulysses, you get, we, uh, the, 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 the film is 20 minutes, you don't even get the China story yet. The, the, the film is still continuing, uh, I'm still following the story. But if you look at Dr. Wee's story, we dive through, uh, we dive into his story, and then we dive into the artwork. And then the, 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 the story expands. And through him, you understand how the politics, the dynamics, the infrastructure, the weaknesses of the scene, and you go back to him again. How many collectors in the art world can do that? You know, I think lastly, um, it's also collectors who are willing to, to go as far as this. Uh, there is one other collector I've been following, um, and they're ready to shoot anytime. But I'm uncomfortable until the collector himself has seen this second film. Yeah. Because if he's he's not seen, he's not ready. You know, so it, it, it is not easy to actually get the, the, the right collectors on board. Any questions? Do you know how many collectors like that? Very, very few in the world. I think my own estimation after talking to people in the art world, maybe about four or five in, in the world. And that's that's why I can do this. That's why I can take this independently. If it there would be 50, it's impossible. Right? And it's because it's so few, it's worth noting. It's worth the art world noting. It's worth the, the, the general population noting that hey these these are great not just art stories, but human stories. You know, live through art. Yeah. And how many artists The art works? Yeah. Maybe about 2005, roughly. But you don't count. You don't count. The different artists that are Oh, yeah, many, many. Um, they, they, they can't tell you even. From all over the world? Oh, no. Okay. The other criteria about the artists, but the collectors is, each of the collectors, must collect that scene only, 80%. Because I'm actually trying to represent them, to show you, Dr. Wee, in his collection, 30 years, you're only looking at Indonesia. But if his collection is 40% Indonesia, 20% Japanese, 30% uh, other Asian, do you, does he have credibility to talk about Indonesia? 
No. That's why the, the their collection has been predominantly from that single scene. And we stick and Dr. B satisfies that criteria. <laughs> I want to ask about the two points that you, you took in the two documentaries, right? So uh, about these six, like uh, to which museum or where this collection, like to which museum you would donate the, the collection and where the collection would end up, right? Even though um, you, when you when you shipped the film, it was kind of announced so that the, the collection would go to Ampers, and also the amount involved, it's partly donation, partly yes. purchase. So, so um, there are lots of um, 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 debate yes. uh, around that. And then in uh, Dr. Wee's case, it's more kind of evidence. And from the documentary, we also see that they have a very strong personality of collectors. And what's the process when you're claiming them and talking to them? How do you like, personally um, you go through the process with them as well, particularly in Dr. Lee's case. How do you how do you put yourself uh, like which position and how do you kind of observe the, is there any uh, as a collector but then also as a human being, how did we act and how did we behave in the middle of this? Now in the documentary we can't we can be called directors but we don't direct the story. Right? So as directors, we uh, we follow the story, right? And so the premise is already set from the very beginning when I told them you are not funding your own film. I will find the money because I want independence. I want the ability to be able to follow the story negatively or positively, your lovers and your haters. So they knew that. And which is why I think in the middle of it, when the Dr. Please film was um, withdrawn from the Singapore Museum. Um, uh, the two screenings, the world premiere in Singapore, it was withdrawn from both the screenings because his the distractors, the detractors actually wanted to stop. They changed their mind, you know. So uh, the, the, the collectors knew from the beginning that they had no control. Um, as to how far I went with them, I think it's very different with both of them. Police say if, if you meet him in the beginning, he was very cold. He was very, very cold. Um, maybe typical Swiss, you know. Um, and if you can see, his face is always quite stunned. When we shot this, when he agreed to the project, the, uh, the donation was not announced. I didn't even know. I, uh, I contacted him a year before the donation was announced. So I didn't know. I just found that his way of approaching the collection is very interesting. So when it when it happened, when I shot it, it was three days after the announcement. And we didn't have that relationship. We didn't have that relationship of trust. To him, he was just, okay, well, you have a list of questions, I ask you questions, right? And so the, the, the relationship, um, working relationship only happened when we were working through the book. Because the book, the book accompanies the film and the book funds the film. So it is through the book I sold the money. I bought one camera, two camera, one lens. If I have $400, I buy a lens. If I have $1,000 from the book, I buy a camera. If I have $1,000, I buy a light. And then six months later, I got some equipment and I ran out of money uh, as I shot Dr. Lee because it, instead of just a 20 minute film, the, the, the story expanded into four years. I ran out of money, I had to shoot it myself. And so the, the equipment came in handy. So um, with police, um, we are working on second edition, so the relationship is easier now because he saw through his own process, even as we walked through the book. And he says, oh, I don't want to say this. No, I'm sorry, this was, I think this is all right. So he, he's learning to give that editorial space. Um, whereas Dr. We is different. Dr. We, we, we knew each other before. So that's why I had a lot of access to his family. They all trusted me. And that's why when this film was withdrawn, and he, he changed his mind, he, he changed his mind about the way he was portrayed in the film. He saw all the cuts. Five, maybe three times he signed all the agreements. But when his family uh, watched the film with him, 
they thought, oh, this is this film is not so good for you. And he said, you know, maybe it was a good for me. And so in Indonesia, the film was also withdrawn. Not just in Singapore, but in Indonesia it was twice withdrawn. So this film has never been shown in Indonesia. So I had an invitation in uh, in Jakarta to show both films, but I know that Dr. Lee is very uncomfortable. He's not uncomfortable if I show the film anywhere else, but in Indonesia he's very uncomfortable because even the presenter saw the film and said, "Oh no, you, can you can you try to you know take out some parts because if you show this." The media is going to go crazy and we, we can't deal with it. So this, so in due respect, so this, this relationship is, is a give and take. He, he gave me the excess and in return he's not comfortable to be shown. It's fine, I don't show in Indonesia, it's not a commercial film. I respect where your, your discomfort is, but I show elsewhere and he's fine with it. So I think we are still negotiating this. It, and it's true, I think, of most documentary stories. If you want to get close to the skin, you want to represent the reality as clearly as you wish. The relationship is not easy. Because, oh, you know, as Chinese, mm, what is, we don't, we don't like to, we don't like to uh, uh, show too much of our lives. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tight rope. It's very private, especially Chinese, because it's all about the face. So, I always say, I don't know if I can make another Dr. Lee documentary again. I, I, I don't know if I could, because it came with a lot of excess. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Lee, so? Oh, uh, only six was very fast. He only, only said only had three days ago. I asked for five years to get three. So it took 250 questions because of the book, so three days. But then, with the collectors I choose in this series, I follow them for life. So this model of working a documentary is different from how documentaries are usually produced. Why? Because if this were to be a commercial film, you would actually want to get funding from a TV source or you go and pitch for money. But the, the source of funding would then say, well, when is the film going to be finished? Right? I can't tell them because I'm following them to the, the end of their lives or mine, whichever is sooner. And this is what I told them. And which is why it's impossible to get any outside code. It's impossible to get any outside funding. And the only way is for me to learn cinematography, for me to learn editing, and so that I can be there, uh, I can do this economically. And then hopefully by the end of this process, we have two um, big stories, you know, about if we can tell stories of their lives. So even if you look at, uh, you look at me say, it's only a 20 minute film. I have shot more, but the story is developing, it's not formed. And I'm following it. We don't know where it's. So people say, like, you know, for Hong Kong, oh no, he's only doing this part sell, part uh, donation to, to jack up the auction prices. I said, don't worry, I'm going to follow the story, right? So if he's really what people think he, he is doing, he's trying to jack up the auction prices, I will follow the story. And it will be captured in the film. You see, so I, I, this is this is how I would like to do it. So every time when you get to see the film, there will be new things, new aspects of this life, new aspects of Dr. Wee's life. Like Dr. Wee's film, the last one with all the museum visitors, was freshly added. Yeah. So uh, to also tell you that how many years have passed? Uh, Twelve, uh, six years have passed. He's still doing what he, he, he wants to do in a fashion. Scandal or not, uh, fraud or not, authenticity, provenance issue or not, he still does it. A museum um, a representative still visit his private museum. 
at what point in your own career did you decide that this is what you wanted to do and at such a personal level because clearly you're doing it for yourself too, I think. And now what made you want to speak about collectors and look at their life so closely? I, I think um, when I was writing, um, I was writing for the art newspaper, um, flash art, um, different magazines. I met with a lot of collectors, but um, I, I've always had interest in people with interesting lives, especially old people. Yeah. So that's a personal uh, interest. And so when when I saw these individuals, and I thought it would actually be interesting to, to interview. So the entire project didn't begin as films. It begins as a sit-down interview. Let me talk to you. And then it was a friend who said, oh no, these, how old are these people? What, 60, 70? You better feel, you know? So it was then that I, I thought, oh yeah, maybe just stick to camera. So I, I, I stuck on camera. And then somebody said, no, 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 no. You should, you should aim higher, you know? You should get a crew. And so that took about four years for me to learn, buy the equipment, learn how to produce. And when I got to the castle, you can see, I can see this is the story. I have to make a film. And when I got into the film media, I suddenly felt very at home. And I didn't know that I would be at home in this media. I never felt terribly at home, 100% at home on writing. But I feel very at home with film. And maybe I was maybe about 42. <coughs> Or 45 or something like that. So it is it's a byproduct, you know, of always meeting people, having conversations and um, growing with the story and investing in myself, I guess. So you're self-taught as a director. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, I attended master classes because the government um, I applied for public funding and it was rejected. It was completely rejected because they were not Singaporean candidates. So I was stuck for two months. Because I had two candidates who said yes, but I had no funding. I didn't know how to shoot. And so two months later, there was an announcement in the Singapore newspaper that the government was going to introduce, if I'm not wrong, 135 million into training. And I went, that's me. And so I applied. Um, screenwriting, uh, six weeks, nine weeks, um, editing. Um, uh, storytelling, documentary crafting, uh, producing, um, and I sat for two months learning how to operate software because I know from experience how after getting rejected, I will never get the requisite fund to finish my film. So I better learn editing. So I sat down and I learned editing. So the good thing about that is that I have two live projects to apply what I learned, but it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, you know, just to learn from, from that. And so at that time, I was telling Selena, my daughter came back one day and she was working for a bank. And she said, Mom, the bank actually needs this video to be done. I said, oh, no, sorry, it can't be shot by iPhone. Then I had an idea. When is the shoot? They require me to do I shoot it, it's for free, because I'm learning cinematography. Let me do a one-man band. And I did it for three years, just covering events, one man show, doing audio, lights, camera work, just so that I could practice. I just wanted to practice. They paid me minimally. Initially, I didn't ask for money, and they said, no, 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 we have to pay you. And so I did that for three years, just to acquaint myself with camera operations. And then I amassed more equipment, and, and the, the, the projects just grew. So now, if Ulysses say, oh yeah, I, 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 I'm doing this, oh yeah, I just pay for travel on my own, and I can shoot anything I can, I can edit the film and update as and when I like, and uh, every time people view it, it will be different. Oh, if you want to count Dr. Wee's film, right, over four years, if I have to count every cent, it would cost 97,000 Singapore, which is maybe about 70,000 70, US. 
Yeah, but because I did most of the shoot and I got a little bit of government grant, I think I got by with maybe 30,000, uh, 80,000 US. Yeah, to, to make four years, over four years, because I did everything myself. And I had a lawyer on Dr. Lee's film, and she came in pro bono. That's right, but if I had to add in her cost, sorry, 97,000 maybe. So a lot of, there's a lot of favor in the films. Uh, a lot of people in yeah. At what point will you stop growing the same films and make a different one, for example? Add uh, recent edits. At what point did you just decide after this film is complete and you can start another one or move on? No, it will not be complete until it's the end of their lives. Oh my god. Really? So you're going to keep on growing? Yeah, so at least it always laughs at them. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's the end of my life or yours. Yes. Okay. Yeah? So I think let's, let's try with that method, right? I mean, we are not, we are not pitching for any money. I can do it. Why not? Let's try it. Right? It's never been done before, I guess. So they, they know that. So if Uli Sik has interesting projects, I said, oh, update me, let me see which one I can afford to fly to and, and shoot it. Yeah, and of course, I would like to have a third candidate, but I'm waiting for him to watch this. He says, yes, yes, come, but don't show my factory. No, you, I need to go to where I need to go to. Now, you need to watch the film, because if you don't watch the film, we cannot. We cannot enter into it, because you need to know how far I need to go.